Now, I, re I recall telling you earlier this year that one of the things you should uh, remember when doing proofs is work on one side of the equal sign, right? That's a, a very um, big deal when doing proofs and especially when doing trig proofs. I wasn't very strict when um, in chapter two you had to prove that two sides were equal of an algebraic equation, of a polynomial equation, but uh, this time around I'm going to be a lot more strict about this uh, because this is something you have to, have to, have to learn for grade 12 because you'll be doing this all over again with much more complicated proofs. But the thing is, you know, they can be pretty complicated even in grade 11. Uh, even in grade 11, you're going to run into things that you're going to go, how do I prove this? Well, okay, we're going to start off with something that I consider, I, I say I consider very simple, but uh, your mileage may vary. So um, this is page 271 of your textbook, section 4.6 on trigonometric identities. And... Um, they kind of summarize for you right at the start the Pythagorean identity and this is the quotient, they call this the quotient identity really this is just for tan now of course there's cotan, right? Uh, we, could, we could list them out here too so the Pythagorean identity is sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1 the so-called quotient identity is simply tan of x equals sine x divided by cos x. But of course, there's also cotan x, which is equal to cos x over sine x. It's the other way around. In other words, it's 1 over tan x. But of course, tan x is 1 over cotan x. Okay? Um, the reciprocal identities, the other ones, I mean, these are already two reciprocal identities, but here's some more. Secant x is 1 over cosine x, and um, cosecant x is 1 over sine x. Okay? Um, that cotan and tan are just reciprocals of each other. That is mentioned here, but they don't, they also don't explicitly say that, hey, you know, because it's 1 over tan, you can also flip sine over cos to make it into cos over sine. Is that, oh yeah, another thing too, is that if we have tan squared x, that's like sine squared x over cos squared x. That follows the laws of exponents that we learned in the last unit. Well, if we have co, um, cotan squared x, that's cos squared x over sine squared x. It's the other way around. That's why I was able to do this with alpha sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1. This is the Pythagorean identity. There are two other equations that are related to the Pythagorean identity. What if I divided everything by sine squared x? If I divided everything by sine squared x, I get this. Sine squared over sine squared is 1 cos squared divided by sine squared, that gets you this situation, which gives you cotan squared x equals 1 divided by sine squared x is cosecant squared x. Look familiar? That was the problem we just did. So we can actually, sh this is actually one of the Pythagorean identities. There's actually a third one. There's a third Pythagorean identity that's there. What if I take the Pythagorean identity, the original one that we all know, sine squared x plus cos squared x is 1, and now divide everything by cos squared x. So now, if I do sine squared x over cos squared x, I get this situation up here, and that's tan squared x. So that becomes tan squared x plus and I said dividing by cos squared. Well, cos squared divided by itself is 1. Tan squared x plus 1 equals 1 over cos squared x. And that's secant squared x, a third Pythagorean identity. So you can see here we, we got more 
more identities to add here. It isn't just sine squared plus cos squared now. We got two more. They brought their friends with them. So one plus cotan squared, one plus cotan squared x equals, I believe, co was cosecant squared x. The other one was tan squared x plus 1 equals secant squared x. So now, now we got a few more that we can work with. Um, notice that, but the main ones are these, from these on down. Those are the main ones. These two are basically derived from the Pythagorean identity that comes directly from your graph. If you remember the unit circle, and I showed you, I showed you in the video how how you can get x and y on a unit circle. If x and y is a point directly on the circle, then x is co uh, cosine x and y is sine x. And so like a right angle triangle, that the uh, adjacent squared uh, plus the opposite squared equals the hypotenuse squared. That sine x, sine squared x plus cos squared x is always equal to one, and it's always equal to one on the unit circle. Well, this came, this comes straight from the unit circle, and it comes straight from the right angle triangle. These two here are derived from this. Okay. You can actually, um, you know, you can actually do a lot of things with these. Like for example, another another thing you can do. Uh, for example, sometimes you might recognize 1 minus, if I bring the cosine over, I get 1 minus cos squared x, and what's left is just sine squared x. This is another, you know, this is related. It's, it's just a rearrangement of the terms from the Pythagorean identity. And of course, if I do 1 minus sine squared x, I get cos squared x. Again, just a re relationship to, to this one. Of course, I can do the same to these, right? I can do cosecant squared, cosecant squared x minus cotan squared x equals one, okay? So that's that one there. Uh, I could rearrange that to a, another way too. Or how about if I do tan squared x, uh, sorry, how about if I do it this way? Secant squared x minus tan squared x equals 1. Okay, so I can actually move that around and get 1 that way as well. So you can see that these are, you know, there's a lot of ways you can play with these Pythagorean identities and these are all fine. These are all fine to work with and fine to just sort of move, you know, move terms around like for example multiply both sides by cosine to see what you get and so on. Okay, so our first problem is going to be to prove that cos x times tan x equals sine x. Now, you have to work on one side of the equal sign, and then you have to make the left-hand side, or one side, you have to make one side look like the other side. And the, the way to do it, the way it's often done, is that you take the more complicated side, like this cos tan, side it, and make it look like the simpler side. Okay, so I gotta make my cos times tan look like sine x. Okay, now another thing is, another clue that you're often given is any legal algebra will do. And I say legal algebra, don't start making up your own rules, that's just ridiculous. Okay, so we know that, well, we know that tan is sine x divided by cos x, right? And if we multiply that by cos x, we notice that cos x crosses out and we get just sine x all by itself. And so left hand side equals right hand side. You can see some of these proofs. Like I said, in my opinion, this is a pretty simple proof. It's done and it's all over in one step. I'm using the idea that tan, that tan x is equal to sine x over cos x, right? I'm using that idea to help me solve the problem. And then I substitute sine x over cos x over here. And then I notice that I have cos x that is common on the numerator and denominator. They get crossed out. And what's left is just sine x and we're done. 
Now, those of you who are very persnickety about, um, about restrictions might notice that, hey, I crossed out something in the denominator. Doesn't cosine go to zero somewhere? Oh, yes, it does. It goes, it goes to zero in a lot of places. So there are some restrictions on this because of cos x. Uh, I am not going to, personally, I am not going to needle you on restrictions in, uh, in doing trig proofs. It is not my style to do that. But let's say, what happens if I got up on the wrong side of the bed one day and wrote you a test asking you, yeah, state all the restrictions. <laughs> or at least state the restrictions between x equals 0 and x equals 360. Remember, these are degrees. So where is cos equal to 0 between 0 and 360? 0 degrees and 360 along the number line. Well, cos is 1 at 0. It's also 1 at 360. So um, it's, the endpoints are fine. 180 in the middle is negative 1. Cos of 180 is minus 1. Now, mind you, you could try this on your calculator if you like, but halfway between 0 and 180 is 90 degrees. You'll find on your calculator that the cosine of 90 is actually 0, so we found 1, 0. So here's one place where there's a restriction. So this, in other words, these, these two sides are equal so long as x is not equal to 90 because you get 0 and you can't have division by 0. And another one is over here in, well this is what, 90 degrees, it's between quadrants 1 and 2. Halfway between 180 and 360 is 270 degrees. And over there you'll also find that if you enter the cosine of 270 degrees on your calculator you're going to get 0. And once again uh, there's two places where uh, x is not allowed to be equal to, but everywhere else this identity is proven. Now, if that's the ta if that's the tack you want to take, if you want to be that persnickety about it, personally, I am not going to needle you on uh, the places where you know various trig functions are equal to zero. It's possible, though, that they might needle you on this in advanced functions. Just just a warning. Um, and it's not unrealistic that in grade 11 you might want to know where sine is equal to zero or cosine is equal to zero. You might want to know that or know where 10 is equal to zero. So, you know, because they might make an expression undefined if you divide by those functions. Okay, so uh, that's kind of a heads up, but to be honest with you, if you got this far and said left hand side equals right hand side, I think you're done. Okay, because what I want you to do is to concentrate on the proofs themselves. So I'm not going to ask you to discuss restrictions, although there's, the restrictions are always going to be there. Okay, you will get restrictions, but um, in these proofs, these proofs are not perfect. Okay, when I tried graphing it on a graphing package that I have, um, the graph seemed to fit pretty well. I didn't notice uh, any strangeness around the restrictions. So um, maybe they're just holes in the graph. I'm not sure. Prove, okay. One plus two sine x cos x over sine x plus cos x equals sine x plus cos x. Okay, prove that. And remember I said pick only one side and work on the one side. Just like I did up here. I picked this side, I stuck with it, I got my sign and it's equal. Right? Made the right hand side look like their left hand side. That's the strategy. Well, I want to do that strategy here too. I don't want to touch this side. This is obviously the more complicated side, right? This one over here is obviously more complicated. I want to work on this side. I want to make this side simpler so it looks like this. All right. And I also said any legal algebra could do. And this time, unlike this one, which made use of the equation for tan because tan was part of the original expression, 
this one has a 1 here. And we can make use of that 1 because, put a little sidebar here, 1 by the Pythagorean identity is equal to sine x, sine squared x plus cos squared x. Sine squared x and cos squared x equal 1 all the time. Well, I can make that sine squared x plus cos squared x. So whenever you see a 1 and that's on the complicated side that you're trying to prove, you might want to expand that to sine x, sine squared plus cos squared x, because look what happens now. Here's, here's a really cool problem here. So we get sine squared x plus cos squared x, that used to be 1, plus 2 sine x cos x over sine x plus cos x. Now, you may not find it easy to see this, but that is a quadratic. In fact, that is, well, it's not a, I mean, it's not a quadratic in the polynomial sense, but it certainly has that feel of a quadratic. You have a squared term here, another squared term here, and uh, something that's twice the square root of those things that are squared. And that looks like the formula for a perfect square, which is rather remarkable. So let's, let's just, in fact, just to see what's going on, let's reorder the terms. Sine squared x plus 2 sine x, I'm going to put that one second, sine x cos x, and I'm going to put this one third, plus cos squared x. All right, divided by sine x plus cos x. This is like saying, well, you know, okay, hold on. Let a equal sine x. Let b equal cos x. Let's re just so you can see things a little easier, let's replace these with a's and b's. Let's see what happens. a is sine x, so we have a squared plus as a plus, 2ab plus 2ab plus cos squared x. Oh, that's b, b squared, over, this is a plus b. This is really what we have. Just replace all the sines and cosines with a and b, and you got really a polynomial divided by another polynomial. And absolutely, you can factor it that way too. This is a perfect square on top, and that's a plus b all squared. And that's divided by a plus b. Well, look, they're exactly the same. We can now cross out. This becomes a 1 exponent, and this becomes a plus b. Now, let's replace a and b. a was sine x plus b was cos x. And left-hand side equals right-hand side. Okay, so we started off with a really ugly looking proof. We made use of a 1 and expanded it using the Pythagorean identity, which was this. And we rearranged the terms and noticed that this is in the form of a perfect square. And if you replace these with these parameters a and b, you realize it's exactly the form of a perfect square, so you factor the top, and notice the top and the bottom cancel precisely, and you get a plus b. I'm going to uh, do another problem. I'm going to try one from the textbook, because it does, as I say, make use of the six trig functions. This thing that looks like an r is the Greek letter gamma, okay? Gamma in lowercase. Uh, no reason why I chose the letter. Your textbook on page 273 chooses the letter C, but I think C is boring. And this is question 4C in your textbook. So it's saying prove each identity, meaning prove that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Now it's a toss-up. I guess this one, this side, is slightly more complicated than this side. Here's another thing. When you're working with secant and cosecant and cotent, what I would suggest that you do, and remember, don't touch this side, 
Don't even look at it. Except to check to see if they're the, the two sides are the same. When you're working on this side and you see that there's a secant or one of the uh, one of the reciprocal trig functions there, why not just change them, rewrite them in terms of sine and cosine? In fact, if you see sine, cos, tan, you know, you have your six trig functions, every one of those six trig functions could be totally rewritten in sine and cosine. That makes your job way easier. Okay, so do that. Cosine, gamma, open bracket. This is going to be one over cosine, gamma, r if you like. I think my gammas look like r's. The gamma is supposed to be kind of like a, kind of like that. I don't know, whatever. Minus one. Okay. Working on this side. So, okay, my next step, I have nowhere else to go except to multiply through. Well, cosine over cosine is one, right? If I multiply through, subtract one times cosine gamma is just cosine, oops, cosine gamma. Oh, hey, look, I just stumbled upon it. Left hand side equals right hand side. So the thing is, if you can rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine, and you see a whole bunch of crazy trig functions all over the place, always best to just reduce everything to sine and cosine. That greatly simplifies your problem. So I'm proving that cosecant squared alpha is equal to cotan squared alpha plus one. This is one of the Pythagorean identities. I recognize it. I don't expect you to recognize it. I just want you to make the left hand side look like the right hand side. But I'm gonna show you something that might amuse you about the Pythagorean identity after this problem because that's what this reminds me of. Well cotan squared remember Tan is sine over cos, right? Sine x over cos x, right? Okay. Cotan is the other way around, right? It's cos over sine. It's flipped over. So cos squared alpha, alpha? I'm not writing my alphas very well. Plus one over, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, only this part gets the fraction. You know, I'll just rewrite the whole thing. Equals cos squared alpha over sine squared alpha. Okay, let's see how we do this. Plus one. Okay, this is a little bit... How about if we do it this way? Uh, all right. How about if we do this sine squared alpha over sine squared alpha so that that brings that one into a common denominator, right? Uh, if we make a common denominator, this has to have the denominator sine squared alpha. So this will have to be sine squared alpha over sine squared alpha. So we have cos squared alpha plus sine squared alpha all over just sine squared alpha because it's a common denominator. Well, what's cos squared alpha plus sine squared alpha? It's a Pythagorean identity. It's equal to 1. So we get 1 over sine squared alpha, which is cosecant squared alpha. Oh boy, my alphas are suffering. Okay, and so left hand side equals right hand side. Okay, there's a handout I made, uh, made for you guys uh, which consists of two pages of identities. I'm not expecting you to do all 67 of them. There are a lot. Uh, but if you seriously want to get immersed in this stuff uh, all of these, all of these identities consist of the six basic uh, trig functions, and uh, you don't need to know much more than what I just told you in terms of the basic functions. There's these, and there's the variations. Of course, the variations on the Pythagorean theorem, the Pythagorean theorem itself, um, tan, the formula for tan, the formula for cotan, and the reciprocal formulas for secant and cosecant. Um, basically, um, these are usually a huge help, right? I'm going to work with number 65 near the end of the handout. Uh, secant 
theta, subtract cos theta, tan theta, all divided by tan theta minus, oh sorry, plus secant theta. I want to check that now. Minus sec minus cos. Uh oh, plus 10. Oh my god, there's a plus sign here plus 10, and we have 10 plus secant, and this is equal to sine theta. Okay, so obviously this is the simpler side. We want to make the complicated side look like the simpler side. So obviously it's sometimes, you know, the choice is very easy as to which side to work on. The big deal here is that you got a secant, you got a tan, a tan, and a secant. And remember when I said when you have all these kind of weird trig functions floating around, turn everything into sine and cosine. That usually makes your life a lot easier. So secant is 1 over cosine, cos theta. By the way, when you do enough of these trig proofs, you don't have to memorize these anymore. They come naturally to you. I remember that when I was young and when I was in grade 12. I, I couldn't stand memorizing stuff. But I did a lot of trig proofs. And I found that over time, I just remembered these. I didn't have to, they just came automatic. I, I, I didn't have to think about them anymore. So anyway, secant is 1 over cos theta. And minus cos theta, that doesn't have to change. But tan theta, we got tan is sine over cos. So sine theta over cos theta. Remember that um, you have to have sine of the angle. Just don't just say sine over cos. Sine has to have an angle in front of it. Cos has to have an angle in front of it. Even though it's a Greek letter like theta, it doesn't have to be a number. It can be x, whatever. Tan is sine over cos again. Sine theta over cos theta. And secant is 1 over cos. And it's a plus. 1 over cos theta. I'm going to work across the page so I don't, I don't have to risk uh, going off the screen. But now, notice that I have the possibility, at least on top, in the numerator here, of having a common denominator. I'm going to have, I'm going to have a compound fraction either way, so I might as well live with that fact. So the top looks like two of them have cosine. I'm going to make cosine for everything now. So if, if everything is over cos theta, then 1 over cos theta is okay, because it already has cos theta as a denominator. But cos, how do you get this as cos in the denominator? Well, you'd have to multiply by cos over cos. So this becomes cos squared. Cos squared theta plus, and then you got sine over cos. Well, that's just sine. Sine theta, that's already over cos. I'll put this in brackets because the compound fraction becomes confusing. And then look at this. This is already over cosine. So we got sine theta plus 1 all over cos theta. Now the cos theta is cancel, and you just got this over this, which is kind of neat, you know? So, all right. So I got 1 plus cos squared theta plus sine theta all over sine theta plus 1 turn everything into sine sine theta. Actually, it's not the 1 this time, but the cos squared is the only kind of strange one here. Why not turn that into sine theta? You know how sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is 1? Well, if we rearrange the terms, cos squared theta, what's that equal to? So I can, I can move sine squared over to here and have cos squared theta equal to 1 minus sine squared theta. Okay, so I can turn this into 1 minus sine squared theta. So then in the next step, I got 1 plus, is it plus or minus? Oh, that's a minus. Okay, all right. Always messed up by these things. Okay, so 1 minus, not 1 minus cos squared, but we replace cos squared with 1 minus sine squared. So 1 minus 1 minus a minus is plus sine squared theta plus sine theta over sine theta plus 1. Notice we got 1 minus 1 here. They subtract out. So we got sine squared theta plus 1 
plus sine theta over sine theta plus 1. Sine theta plus 1 over sine theta plus 1, they cancel out. You're left with sine theta, and we go back to the original problem. This is what we were trying to prove in the first place, and so left-hand side equals right-hand side. Okay, this one, this one's a little strange, but it's interesting. Um, sine to the fourth x minus cos to the fourth x equals 2 sine squared x minus 1. So a, a to the fourth minus b to the fourth becomes a squared minus b squared times a squared plus b squared because it's one kind of one way of having difference of squares a squared minus b squared is another difference of squares and that could be full further factored well i'm hoping to do that here we have two things that are to the fourth power and so we can say well sine squared x minus cos squared x times sine i think i'm going to take up this whole line here sine squared x plus cos squared x um, and we're gonna yeah we're gonna take up even more room now with the next line because we're gonna expand this now um, but actually look look at this one actually you know not to not to distract from this relationship and trying to factor this but look at this one isn't sine squared x plus cos squared x the Pythagorean identity isn't this equal to one so aren't all, all that we're left with then is just this. That's all we've got left. So then this factors into sine. So this just becomes 1. That all just goes away because it's the Pythagorean identity. So we got sine x plus cos x times sine x minus cos x. Okay. Um, well... Or another way to put it, maybe maybe we shouldn't put it that way. Because it looks like we're trying to show that it's equal to 2 sine squared x minus 1. We have a squared term here. Now we, we, we factor too far. We, we run out of squared terms. We were lucky over here. We had two squared terms here. So we were better off with that step. And sometimes, you know, you go a little too far and then you have to back up a little bit. Okay? So let, we were better off with this one. Notice that we have sine 2 sine squared x. It's just in terms of sine. Now the Pythagorean identity said that you can have sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1, but then you can actually bring sine squared over to the other side and make cos squared equal to 1 minus sine squared. And that's what I'm going to do. So this is now going to be sine squared x minus 1 minus a minus is plus sine squared x. So now we got 2 sine squared x minus 1. Left hand side equals right hand side. Okay? Don't be afraid of, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes you find yourself going a little too far and it looks like you're, you're moving away from this. So Take that as a signal. Take that as a signal that, okay, i got to back up to a, a previous step, which was a little better, and maybe try a different strategy, which I did. I just tried a different strategy. And there's always more than one way. There's always more than one way out of a step. And uh, you got to be able to be observant of those things.